on behalf of the Men's Issues Awareness Group, I'd like to welcome you all to coming to tonight's event. Men's Issues Awareness, or MIA, is a group of students of all genders that have come together to raise awareness of men's and boys' experiences in areas where they are doing poorly or are adversely affected in some way. I'm really excited to hear about Cafe's new campaign, um, and I'm looking forward to the support it'll bring to the UT campus. I personally became involved um, in MIA due to my interest in mental health, uh, and specifically the lack of resources with, um, for men's mental health. Um, educational achievement is another area where males are doing poorly. In elementary school, standardized tests now show that girls are outperforming boys. In high school, more males are dropping out and fewer males are on the honors roll. Finally, fewer men than women are now attending university. Our speaker tonight, Dr. James Brown, will provide insight into these important issues. Dr. Brown has a lifetime of experience in education. He graduated from Teachers College as an elementary school teacher in 1965 and then went on to obtain six university degrees, including a doctorate in education, as well as postdoctoral diplomas in educational administration, curriculum, and instructional leadership. Dr. Brown has been an elementary school teacher, a secondary school teacher, a department head, a principal, and an Ontario supervisory officer. He has taught all grades from junior kindergarten to grade 13, including special education, in Canada and in the UK, and has lectured at the graduate school level at several universities. He has also written a book titled Rescuing Our Underachieving Sons, and you can find that book outside. Finally, Dr. Brown is the father of five children, a grandfather of nine, and as of three weeks ago, is now a great grandfather as well. Woo! me because this past summer I spent the whole summer traveling through Western Canada doing presentations. I did 37 presentations across Western Canada and one night I did a presentation to two people. So this is a big crowd compared to two people. It happens, right? It's okay. It's like that. I'm talking uh, uh, around the whole issue of the underachievement that boys are experiencing. And when we talk about underachievement, we're not talking about people who can't do it. We're talking about people who can do things, but aren't. For whatever reason, they're not maximizing their potential. And so my interest is in, in the whole area of underachieving boys. And I premise all this with the idea that equality means equality for everyone. So, I will come back to this several times during the evening, but I think the big issue is if we're going to talk about equality at any point, it means equality for everyone, not for just certain people. And so I titled my journeys over the last year, because I've spent a year at this now, as an odyssey for equality. And I hopefully don't have to explain things like the symbols that are on there. I am concerned that we should be looking at equality, and so I have been working on an odyssey for equality, and I've been traveling for close to a year now in several countries. So uh, this evening I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that the future for the current cohort of boys is worse than any of us really imagined. So if you've been reading things in the press about the difficulty boys are in, it's a lot worse than what the press is reporting. You're looking at the tip of the iceberg. The future of this current cohort of boys is really bleak. That's the bad news. Added to that, those boys don't <laughs> exist in a vacuum. So what's bad for those little boys 
is ultimately going to be bad for our whole society. It's going to be bad for parents. It's going to be bad for brothers and sisters. It's going to be bad for future spouses. It's going to be bad for our economy. When we're looking at having as many as 15% of our young men permanently unemployed, it's going to be tough on us when we have to pay the taxes to carry that load, plus the fact of what we lose in terms of production. So ultimately, what's bad for those little boys is bad for all of us. Male or female, it's bad for all of us. And, and added to that, if we correct this problem today, right now, tonight, we correct this problem, it'll be 15 or 20 years before we see the results of it. Correct that right now. Before we leave tonight, we correct it. We won't see the positive side of it for 15 or 20 years. And during that time, we're going to gradually become aware of what's happening to us, and what's happening to our society, and what's happening to us in general. Now, if you have any doubt on this, just think back to what the Ontario government did in the 1990s. The government decided that it was spending too much money on health care. So the decision was made, we'll reduce the number of doctors. Then we'll have fewer people billing OHIP. So they reduced the intake of students into medical schools. You doubt that? Check. Absolutely correct. Lo and behold, some years go by, and we find ourselves with a shortage of doctors. So we've increased the intake of doctors. But you know what? You don't get the results of that overnight. You increase the number of intake of doctors, you're looking at 10 to 15 years before you're going to see any significant impact in the number of doctors in the province. So the decisions that are made are, are looking at long-term results. It's going to take a long time before we see the results of that. So if we solve the problem tonight, don't go away thinking it's all cured tomorrow. Years in the future. Now there's good news. I said it was bad news and good news. The good news is that there are a lot of practical things that we can do. So it's not like, okay, I'm here to tell you more doom and gloom. No, no, I'll tell you a bit of doom and gloom. But I'm also going to tell you practical things we can do to make a difference. Because there's absolutely no point in me telling you a sad doom and gloom story. The value is, if I say to you, here are some things we can do. And I might add practical things. There's no point in talking about things we can't manage. Practical things. And of course, the key to all this is, at virtually no cost. And fundamentally important, the things I talk about tonight in no way disadvantage girls. So I'm not going to talk about, here's what we can do, and then in the process we're going to disadvantage girls. Ah. After all, it would be absolutely unconscionable to deliberately advantage one group at the expense of another. <laughs> Wouldn't it? I think so. I think it would be disgraceful. It would be unconscionable. So we have to be looking at things we can do that don't advantage one group by hurting another. Because equality needs equality for everyone. So I'm going to give you a bit of the historical context. One of the advantages of being at my age is I've lived through a lot of this probably the only advantage, but it's one of the advantages that I have it. <laughs> I am honestly a great-grandfather. I've been telling my grandchildren for years I'm a great-grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> now it's official. Now just in case anybody here doesn't know this, go back to 
years before the 1970s, in general, boys were outperforming the girls in school. If you doubt this, you check. You'll find that on the standardized tests that were given starting in 1949 in the United States, boys were consistently scoring higher. And boys had higher graduation rates from secondary school, and boys made up the overwhelming majority of students in universities and colleges. Particularly in areas like mathematics and science. So now we had people saying, wait a minute now, we've got a problem here. And we did have a problem. We did have a problem. So we proclaimed there's a girls' crisis. And there was. <coughs> So to contend with this, a lot of initiatives were undertaken. Now these included, among others, now if you doubt this, you just remember I lived it. We had gender selective hiring in education in order to provide female gender identification in non-traditional roles. Now if you doubt this, I was the assistant superintendent of personnel in the biggest school board in the country. And we were hiring women, particularly for secondary school and for science and math. We simply put the male applicants aside and we hired the women. Not to advantage those women, but because girls <coughs> didn't have the role models and their gender gender identification, they did it. And equality means equality for everyone. So those little girls needed those models. So we had gender selective hiring. I went from being assistant superintendent personnel to being a superintendent of education. And guess what? Personnel was part of my portfolio. So I continued to do this. I went on to be a director of education, and we continued to do it. So if you question this, check. Go ahead. But I was there, and I'm proud to say I did it. Because it was for the benefit of those little girls. We also had gender selective promotion. So when we got applications, for principalships, we took all the male applicants and we put them in one pile. We took the female applicants and we only considered them. If we couldn't find a suitable female candidate, then we'd look at the men. Now, if you think we did this for those women, you're wrong. We did this because we needed to create gender identity for little girls in the school system. I'm not embarrassed to say this. I did it, and other school boards did it. But equality means equality for everyone. So we needed to do that. See, the education system, and I'm going to repeat this too, the education system doesn't exist to provide good paying jobs for teachers. It exists to provide the opportunity for children to maximize their potential. So we need to do the things that are right to cause that to happen. This was part of it, and I'm not embarrassed about it. In fact, I'm proud of it. We had gender selective examination grading. If you wanted to become an Ontario supervisory officer, that's a superintendent or a director, if you wanted to become one of those people, you had to pass a written and an oral exam. Now, you don't have to do that anymore, but you did. If you want to know what the fail rate was, the fail rate was 80%. 80% of the people who did those exams failed. You could go into that exam and the person sitting next to you would say, how many times is this for you? Why? Well, I'm sitting in the exam and I said, First time, the guy sitting next to me says, 
Well, that's my fourth. Another guy says, this is my sixth time writing that exam. I said, this is my first and only. I'm not doing it after this. So I was on the examining board. The ministry representative came in and said to us, I was on the ministry examining board doing oral exams. The ministry representative came in and said, if the candidate is a woman, she automatically passes. Now you could say, terrible. No, no. If you don't increase the pool of qualified applicants, you aren't going to have female superintendents. If you don't have female superintendents, it has a ripple effect back to those little girls again. So, am I here to apologize for it? Not at all. I'm here to say, that's what we needed to do. And we did it. Gender selective post-secondary school scholarships <coughs> occurs for women to attend programs such as medicine. I might add, there are more women in medical programs now than there are men. And we still have these gender-selective scholarships for women only. We have none for men only. We have a lot for women only. We needed them. Do we need them now? Well, it's another issue. Now, these initiatives have the intended consequence. So don't, I mean, this isn't, this, this is not some evil plan. It was intended to accomplish some things to deal with the fact that little girls didn't have gender identity models. The initiatives had their intended consequences. Unfortunately, they had a lot of unintended consequences. A lot of things we hadn't anticipated. A lot of them. So some of these include, we now have a significant reduction in the number of male teachers in all levels and in positions of responsibility. Now, I was introduced as having originally trained as an elementary school teacher. I have a B.Ed. that prepared me to be a, an elementary school teacher. I have a second B.Ed. I'm also a qualified secondary school teacher. In my elementary school cohort, a third of the candidates were men. The current percentage is 20%. And the number of men studying to be elementary school teachers is now 5%. 5 percent. Right now, if you've got a little boy and he goes to school, there's a 20% chance that you'll have a male teacher you can identify with. Before long, it'll be 10%. And then it'll be 5%. And just by way of interest, if you want the stats on this, when I started teaching, five out of six men that went into elementary school teaching stayed in teaching. Five out of six, now it's one out of two. So that 5% isn't actually going to be 5% of the teachers. <coughs> Sounds like a horror story. See, one of the really serious problems of this, because this isn't about teachers. This is not about providing jobs for men. This is about boys' gender identification with education. If I go into a context, and this was the secondary school problem incidentally, girls went into a secondary school and virtually all the teachers were men. Education was something boys did. College and university, same thing. Now we got little boys arriving in school and there are lots of schools in this province that have absolutely no men in them at all. Not even the custodian. Nobody. We have lots of them. We have all kinds of them with one man in it. 
We have all kinds of them with one man who's due to retire. So who are the little boys going to identify with? And so little boys are now coming home from school, and you can deny this, except that I deal with it all the time. Little boys are coming home from school, and they're saying, I don't want to go. School is for girls. I don't belong. School is for girls, because everybody in the building is female. This was the problem we dealt with in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, in reverse. There's also been an increase in unintended, please underline that, unintended, teacher bias, teacher gender bias, in a lot of areas. One of them is a general lack of acceptance of boys in school. It's the cloud of disapproval. Go into any staff room in an elementary school, any staff room, and when they start discussing their student makeup in their classroom, they will moan about the number of boys they have. Geez, I got a terrible class this year. I got 15 boys. Been in a lot of staff rooms. General disapproval. Academic grades are awarded to boys based on their behavior rather than their academic performance. Doubt that? There's a recent study out of the U.S. replicated in the U.K. that looks at kindergarten aged children. Kindergarten. They did standardized testing with these kindergarten children looking at their level of English, and their level of math and science. The girls were slightly ahead in English, the boys were ahead in math and science. Thousands of examples. They didn't just do two children. Thousands. They did it like system wide. Two different countries it's been done in. Maybe more than that. I haven't checked Australia or New Zealand. And then they asked the teachers rate these children. And the teachers said, the girls are significantly ahead in English and ahead in both math and science. Except that wasn't true. But you see, that's unintended gender bias. And it's based on the idea that this little kid's a pain in the behind. I could have used other words, but anyway. This little kid's a pain in the behind. And using the Hawthorne effect, or the halo effect, I see him as an underachiever or someone who's not doing all that work. And if you doubt that, I, mean, I could give you dozens of examples. But the studies are there, based on their behavior rather than their performance. And what's wrong with their behavior? Well, we look at that. But right now, we also have boys getting lower grades than girls for identical work. Now, you're going to sit here and say, no, that's not true. Excuse me? <coughs> Study done at Queen's University. Replicated in the U.S., replicated in the U.K. I've been in all three countries. I've done research in all three. They gave teachers <coughs> examples of student work. It had a boy's name on it. It got a lower grade than if it had a girl's name on it. The same piece of work. The study's been done three times that I know of. Don't misunderstand. This isn't some kind of horrible plot. It's not that at all. It's just that we have a vision in our head. And the one that the, the student that is cooperative and friendly and easy to get along with must be doing better than the one who's a pain in the eye. Now, another set of problems. Parents' expectations for their children's future, their son's future educational success is affected by the fact that teachers telling them 
well, you know, your son's not doing all that well. Well, you know what? He's doing better than the teacher thinks he is. Only now the parent takes that on board. Whether the parent does it on purpose or not, the parent now begins to have those expectations dropping. Well, you know, my daughter will go to university, but I don't know about my son. I don't think he's going to make it. This comes out of this unintended. So don't misunderstand. It's unintended. But it's there, and the research is clear. Now we got normal behavior. That is normal in the sense of how boys normally behave. Coming to be viewed as unacceptable. I tell the story of, and I, I'm, I'm probably going to regret doing this, but anyway, I tell the story of having, of walking across a, a, a school yard on my way to the principal's office because of some research we were doing. So I'm walking in this direction, and there's a male teacher in the art supervision in front of me, and I had just passed a woman teacher on supervision behind me. So I'm walking this direction, and some little boys went running past. And I hear the teacher yell at them. I look around, and she now has them standing facing the fence for the rest of the recess. So I, I hadn't seen any of it, so, so I asked the male teacher, what did they do? And he said, and I quote, because this burned in my brain, I don't know, it all looked pretty normal to me. It was normal for him, because he used to be a little boy. You know what? I was never a little girl. I got two daughters. Honest, I've never a little girl. Honest. I have two daughters. I don't really know what it's like to be a little girl. I have six granddaughters. I still don't know what it's like to be a little girl. I know in theory what it's like. I've never been there. <coughs> never been there. My son and I were talking to my two daughters. One of my daughters has three daughters, and they're all teens. I know. <laughs> and she said, the daughter said, it's a lot harder to be a girl growing up than it is a boy. Now, my son may or may not remember this. But we looked at each other and said, well, it's different. But don't tell me it's harder. It's different. But you see, if you've never been a little boy, you don't necessarily know what normal behavior for little boys is. Now we got boys increasingly being suspended for, from school for things that were acceptable a few years ago. So we have a 100% increase. We've doubled the number of boys being suspended from school. And you'd be amazed at the number of little boys that are being suspended from preschool. How the heck do you suspend a kid from junior kindergarten? They've got boys being misdiagnosed, and I'm going to use that term, misdiagnosed with ADHD. Now, I'm not telling you that ADHD doesn't exist. So don't, please, don't go away and say Crazy Brown says ADHD doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. But when 20% of the secondary school boys in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD, <laughs> we have a problem. And in many cases, it's because their boyish behavior is deemed to be unacceptable. And in the UK, the government has actually had to intervene in this because teachers are telling parents, you, your son will not be allowed back in school until he's medicated. Check it. Check anything. The, the UK newspapers do, do a bit of a search on it. You'll find out exactly what I'm saying. The UK government has had to intervene in this. We don't have a problem? We have a problem, though. Is it intentional? No, it's not intentional. It's just when I see this kind of behavior, it's not the kind of behavior I would have engaged in when I was a little girl. Well, 
guess what? It's boyish PD. We've got boys being identified with learning disabilities. But in many cases, have been caused by the school. You doubt that? There's research on this, too. How about I tell you this? This isn't, the, I'm not using gender at the moment, but I will. If a child was born in the last two months of the calendar year, he or she is four times as likely to be identified with a learning disability than if the child was born in the first two months of the calendar year. Phases of the moon, right? Except, if you look in the UK where they don't use December, January as they cut off, they use August, September. If you were born in August, or sorry, July and August, four times as likely. So how did that learning disability happen? And incidentally, it's almost exclusively boys. Okay, we got boys being marginalized. And consequently, they're becoming disinterested in schooling in general. Doubt that? In the last 10 years, we've had a 70% increase in the number of boys declaring that they'll never set foot in a classroom again once they're no longer required. I didn't invent this. The research is clear on it. So quiet in here, you think this is absolute doom and gloom. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of this is happening as our society moves more and more to a knowledge-based economy. I mean, if it happened in the days when I could go and work on the farm, probably not a big issue, but it's happening now. And that's not an option. I worked with a teacher one time who came from the islands. And somebody said to him, because he was, he was gradually eliminating everyone from his class, and someone said to him, what are these kids going to do? And he said, let them go and cut cane. <laughs> we don't have any cane fields. And we don't have labor-intensive farming anymore either. I'm interested in this. This is from Dave Cook. If you think I'm not current, that's Shastanese. Yeah. Now, in case you don't know who Dave Cook is, he's the former education minister. And Dave was the co-chair of the Education Improvement Commission when I was director of the Education Improvement Commission. So I know Dave fairly well. I have a big map hanging over my fireplace that I was given by my staff, and it's Cook's Voyages, because I spent so much time on the road with Dave Cook. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we got to fly Bearskin Airlines. If you don't know anything about Bearskin Airlines, it's worth looking at. Bearskin Airlines, you get on board one of their planes, they give you your, they play a tape, gives you your instructions in French, English, and Cree. The airplanes are so small, you crawl to your seat. Every seat's a window seat. <laughs> you look out the window, it's windy. The plane is moving sideways. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting experience. Well, Dave and I traveled all over with this. Dave is considered, he's deemed to be one of the real experts on education in, in terms of government terms. You see Dave regularly on uh, Steve Pagan's show. He's usually on panels. 
That's that's what he's talking about. Incidentally, that's not very far from the right. Okay, so on these, this gender bias, unintended gender bias, is resulting in increased instances of depression, sleep disorders, and suicide. Now, in case you think I'm making that one up, I've been part of a group dealing with the issues around depression and sleep disorders. And, and childhood depression and childhood sleep disorders mostly affects boys. Okay, so what is our government doing about it? Government, generally speaking, isn't even prepared to admit this exists. Because if they do, they're going to lose political and financial support from some very important groups. I can't say that I blame them. I mean, their number one priority is to get reelected, right? So I can understand the dilemma here. And the education system appears to be unwilling or unable to deal with it. And if you tell me I'm wrong on this one, well, there's 40-something years down the tubes. Don't learn anything. And a lot of parents and other adults either haven't got any interest in the issue, or they have an interest in the issue, and they've tried to deal with the school system and got nowhere. And I see, on average, two to three people a week who are parents of boys who have fought the school system and, as always, lost. Now, it's not the parents who are really lost. It's those little boys that have lost. So we hear comments like these. Now, this is one of my favorites. Girls have always done better. Well, if someone who was born in the 1990s tells me that, I realize the 1970s is ancient history if you were born in 1990. <laughs> See, I only vaguely remember the events around the Second World War. Like, I was born at the end of the war. So that's ancient history for me. In fact, for a number of the people in the room here, if I mentioned Elvis, it would be ancient history. <laughs> so boys, so girls haven't always done better. But if you only want to take the last number of years, yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, I'm talking to a group of people here. If you don't have any sons, who cares, right? Doesn't affect you. I've talked to I don't know how many school systems. Every single school system says the same thing to me. Well, not in our system. We meet every child's needs. I have that in writing. I have it in writing from school systems. Get out their EQAO results and see if it's true. Another group. Well, my son's doing fine. So Frankly, why do I care about yours? In fact, if yours is doing badly, mine's going to look even better. <clears throat> and another favorite that's hitting us all the time now. Oh, they used to be crybabies. This is another one of my favorites. What can I do? I'm just one parent. And when I talk to the school board officials, the school board officials say, well, yours is the only child having the problem, and you're to blame. You're just a lousy parent. Nobody else in the system is having the problem. All right, okay, okay. okay. Enough of the doom and gloom. I promised you I'd give you some good news, so I probably try to do it fast. The good news is there are things we can do. So we need to change the things we can change. As they say in the business, it's time for a paradigm shift. We know, this isn't maybe, the research is breakthrough. 
Children come from, uh, achievers come from more stimulating home environments where parents spoke and read to them and with them more. The research also tells us that the number one predictor of long-term success in school is how well a child's doing before he gets to school. So there are things we can do as parents. We can recognize the holistic nature of learning. Now when I say that, this is critical. It's absolutely critical that we recognize that learning is holistic. So, some examples. If you speak to young children, your babies, face to face, they see your lips and they see your facial expression. And that's part of how they learn language. Incidentally, we do this more with girl babies than we do with boys. You can deny that the research is clear. The research is suggesting maybe the major thing is that we speak with our children, not just to them. So we engage in conversation with our children. I'm not talking about four hours of it. But four minutes wouldn't hurt. <coughs> Do it regularly. Read to and with our children. Listen to them read. The research tells us we do this regularly with girls, we don't with boys. Parents will deny that. And then when you videotape, you'll see that that's exactly the case. That we read much more to our daughters than our sons. The excuse? Well, I read to him, but he loses interest and he goes and plays with trucks. Well, you know what? He didn't go deaf. You can still keep reading to him. Just because he's playing the truck doesn't mean he doesn't hear you anymore. It's not like dealing with an adult who turns around and walks out on you. Not much point in being even read to a man. Children need to see you reading, especially, it's especially important for the same sex adult. So if you're a dad, it's really important that the kids see you read. Because you see, reading is something that's guys do. You know how I know that? It's dad and I do it. Really, really, really important. So whether you're a dad, or you're a stepdad, or you're a granddad, or you're a great granddad, <laughs> it's important that that child see that. Give children <coughs> their own books even before they can read. One of the things we've learned, one of the, I meant to bring a book in, one of the things that we've learned is that children, when they own a book, they develop an affinity for books. It's kind of like walking around with a teddy bear on the floor of this book. You're walking around, it's my book. Can't read a word of it. This is my book. <laughs> Will you read my book for me? Uh, thank you very much. I'm not taking my teddy bear to bed at night. I'm taking my book. If you've got an affinity for books, when you hit school, you're miles ahead. You're miles ahead. Guess what? We buy 10 times as many books for girls as we do boys. The stats are clear on it, 10 times. Go into a bookstore and try to find books for little boys. They largely don't exist. If you were a publisher and you said, you can pr produce books for a market this big, or you can produce books for a market that big, which one you, would you produce for? Now, sorry, rhetorical question. Uh, the, the answer is obvious. The people who want to lose money would produce for this one. We buy 10 times. So we need to be looking at giving children books. So that, like, I didn't give my children books. I didn't know this. We had all the books, like a library. Take whatever book, whatever age you're at. If I had to do it over again, I'd say, here's the book. Personalize it. Draw it. Color it. It's yours. Engaging in physical contact is part of that reading experience. You know when you sit there and the child sits with you, there's a bonding that takes place. And if you're familiar with Pavlov and the, and the dog and the salivation, 
the dog is given food and it salivates. And Pavlov, Pavlov rings a bell. After a number of times, he doesn't present the food anymore. It just rings the bell. And the dog salivates. The child sits with you in that chair, physical contact, and reads the book with you. And then you know what? You're not even there. And the child sits in that chair and picks up the book and gets that same feeling that that child got sitting there in proximity with you. You have just created a lifelong reader. Guess what? We do it with girls. We don't do it with boys. So then they, there are specific characteristics of books for boys, which is why I say if you go into bookstores, certainly in North America, and I know in the UK, probably, it's probably the same in a number of other countries, but you know, I'm familiar with those about the books for them. They have specific characteristics that make them look suitable for the boys. So if you keep in mind the holistic nature of learning, it's books that have a male as a central character. In other words, the boy can identify with the character. Books that boys can actually own. Obviously, you're not going to give them the collected works of Shakespeare or Leonard Bound and say, here, personalize it. <laughs> books that contain action, adventure, problem solving by boys, things that boys are going to relate to. You want books that show that central character modeling the kind of behaviors you want. So if not much point saying when I provided my book with my child with uh, some of the books, and here's the book I provided them with, you know, uh, an unending horror story of uh, murders and so on. You want the books that show the kind of behavior that you want children to have. Books where the vocabulary allows the parent to read the book to the child and before the child can read and the child is able to read, the child reads it along with the parent and then eventually reads the book for him or herself. So I couldn't find any in the stores. So along with some colleagues, I have produced some books for boys. And that's, this is one example. And there's another one. You notice the difference. <laughs> You probably notice the difference in this one. Les you? So there are some of them out here if you want to take a look at them. But the whole idea of it is, the whole idea of this is, there's no point in giving a, a little boy, or a very little point, I should say no point, book after book that has, you know, Disney princesses. Fine for your daughter. But your son is going to have trouble identifying with that. I'm sorry. You might not like me saying that. We, we might be looking at a world where there is no gender identity. But the fact of the matter is, in the world where it exists right at the moment, right at the moment, it's pretty important that your, son, your sons or your grandsons or your nephews or whatever be able to identify with these. And there are things the education can, that system can do. See, it's important because everything that happens at school is part of the curriculum. So, if you're made to feel good about yourself, that's part of the curriculum. If you're made to feel badly about yourself, that's part of the curriculum too. We need to provide, or the school, I think, should provide parents and preschool children with information and simple books free of charge. I mean, if you spend 10 bucks per preschool boy you've got out there and send them some material, I think big difference for them. And that isn't even pocket change. That isn't even pay cash. See, we've got a situation on our hands now, and this is largely due to uh, societal factors and, and also parenting practices that, are, that are, have changed. We've got some boys now as much as six months before, behind girls of their own age when they arrive at school. Didn't tend to have that 30 or 40 years ago. Do now, though. And you know what? Many of these boys are never going to catch up. Which is evidence that the school system is not really very good at closing that gap. Hey, I spent 
all these years in the school system. I'm pretty good at helping the kids close that gap. And this is a gap that started before the child got to school. So we got boys struggling in school, some developing learning disabilities that are psychological nature. And these kids being disengaged in schooling. See, the problem is we have no cure for those learning disabilities. We can help the child learn to compensate for a learning disability. We don't have a cure for it. Now, I speak from first-hand experience. I have a learning disability. But I've learned to compensate for it. Because obviously when I went to school, nobody had ever heard of special ed. No, no, no. I, I think I'll school to log in, but not much out that. The education system could actually solve most of this problem. And I know that from first-hand experience. Because one of the school systems, school systems I was in did it. We solved. We made the changes that were it took us five years, but we made the changes that were necessary. And we eliminated the problem. We went from 11%, for example, we went from 11% non-organic learning disabilities to virtually zero. The director retired. I was the superintendent. I went to be director of another board. The coordinator of student services retired. The coordinator of primary education went to be a superintendent on the board. Two years later, there was no evidence that it ever happened. They were back to 11% learning disabilities. Heartbreak. Absolutely heartbreaking. But I know it can be done. And I have the research evidence to prove it. Well, the school system appears to prefer to prefer to operate on the basis of let the problem happen and then we'll come up with remedial action to solve it after the fact. Except we can't solve it. We can help children learn to cope, but we can't solve that problem that could have been prevented in the first place. What does it need? It needs a change in philosophy and it needs a cha change in commitment. So we can do it. However, it won't happen easily. So we have to have the system put the interests of children first. We have a task, folks. Be heard. Speak out. Achievers tend to have received more support and encouragement. All well, practical things parents can do. Have a daily conversation with your child in school. I'm not talking about a two-hour conversation. I'm talking about five minutes. And my favorite is, what did you learn in school today? And the answer to that is? Nothing. <laughs> On cue, one, two, three. Nothing. I guarantee you that's the answer you get. But you know what? You stay with it. You stay with it. And the children begin to talk to you about what they did at school today. And you know what? The research out of Simon Fraser University tells us that kids make as much as a 30% gain in achievement just by parents doing that. Five minutes a day! 30% gain! Well, I can't afford five minutes. My kid doesn't matter that much. Set and clarify expectations. So, now. In the morning, before a child goes out of school, what are you going to do in school today? So we set some expectations of what we might do at school today. Been there, done it, know it works. Research is clear on it. Now we're talking another two minutes, so gosh, we're up to seven minutes today. <laughs> Model the desired behavior. You want your child to be a reader? 
I'll hasten to see you reading. I'm not talking about pocket novels. You know the child says you read the paper, the newspaper. But if a child, or, or, or uh, you know, Hot Rod Magazine, whatever. The point is, if the child sees you reading, you're modeling a desired behavior. Now, share your personal knowledge of your child with that your child's teachers. A lot of us have been through the parent-teacher interviews. Well, forget parent-teacher interviews. Try parent-teacher conferences. The teacher is the expert on education. I'll accept that. But I'm the expert on my child. So I'm going to tell you about my child. Because there are things you need to know about my child. And those things will make a difference for you as a teacher if you know these things about my child. Engage in conferences where you meet as equals. I, I said this last week in a parent evening. Unlike you, they all convulsed in laughter. They thought the word equals was really funny. Maybe you've had better experiences than a lot of us have had. Get involved in local school council. You notice I used the word school council. It's not a parent council. It's a school council. You don't have to be a parent to be involved in it. You don't have to have children in the school. Get involved. Have them talk about something besides fundraising. That would be novel. Have the same high expectations for your sons as your daughters. We used to have higher expectations that our sons would go to university than our daughters. It's now reversed. The number one, one of the number one predictors is, do you have high expectations for your child? Good things the education system can do. Recognize that teachers and parents aren't co the teachers aren't co-parents. Guess what? They're not co-parents. When I taught your child, I wasn't co-parent. I didn't have to sit up all night because the child was sick. I didn't have to worry about where the money was going to come from, buying a pair of shoes. Guess what? When I worked in the school system, I was an employee. I didn't run, when I was a director, I didn't run the school system. I worked for the school system. Have them modify, the schools could modify programs so the kids can actually begin where they are. This gets me back to, if a child is a year older than another child, a child with a December birthday versus a January birthday, do you expect those two children to be able to do the same thing on the same day? If you're a parent and you have two children that are a year different in age, do you expect them both to learn to walk the same day? To talk the same day? Be toilet trained the same day? Somehow the school system thinks they're all going to read the same day. Not going to happen. Convenient or not, every school classroom in this country is a one-room schoolhouse. Because the kids are all over the map. Not convenient for the teacher, but it's reality. Achievers tend to have higher self-esteem, so they're practical things parents can do. Remember that children tend to rise to the expectations you set for them. If you think your son's going to be a loser, guess what? You started them on that road already. Help your children to achieve success by using whatever advice I've presented, and any other sources you might have. And refuse to allow an expert who has nine months of professional training convince you that, he, that she, in this case, knows your child better than you do. I can't think of another, I, I trouble thinking of any occupation, any serious occupation, where you'd operate with nine months of training. Believe me, I had surgery. I was sure glad that the surgeon didn't have nine months of medical training. I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't be here, so. And never forget that as parents, you're the number one advocate for your children. So there are things the school system can do. One is accept the fact that it's okay for boys to be boys. Accept the fact that boys and girls are different. Boys aren't defective girls. They're boys. They're different. The job of the women teachers is to correct those defective boys by making them more girl-like. Place 
some value on theoretical or practical as well as theoretical approaches to learning. I realize we're running out of time here, but practical approach. I learned the parts of the flower and how they work together. I sure would have been better off if I learned the parts of the fuel injector and how it worked. Especially on my way home tonight if my car breaks down. That's an approach to learning. It's not put the kid in a class where he can work with his hands. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about learning how parts of organizations work together and how they operate. And you know what? If I have to choose between the flower, which I know very well, incidentally, and the fuel injector, which I don't know so well, probably we'd be better off knowing about the fuel injector. And you know what? I'd have been a whole lot more interested. Operate schools for the gender equity. Female attributes, interests, and learning styles and values. Boys and girls don't learn the same. I'm not talking about biological reasons, but because of the way we're socialized, we don't learn the same. Equal number of male and female teachers. Well, that would be a, a novelty. Where teachers are aware of their own gender bias when it comes to evaluating student work. Where the staff understands children come the way they come. And if you're a parent, your child came the way your child came. Not the way you want it. Came the way your child came. The way your child came. And I like this one. I think we need gender sensitivity training for all teachers, but especially women teachers in elementary schools. Gender sensitivity training for women? For men, yes. For men, for women? Well, guess what? Female environment, little boys there. I think we need to be more sensitive to that. Achievers tend to work harder because they need to achieve. And there are practical things parents can do, go after your enemies, demand some changes. Point out to government that two years of teacher training is not going to be any better than one year if the program isn't changed. I like this one. This is my friend Dave again. Again, it's reoccurring. We need to recognize gender differences. Remember that schools exist for the benefit of children, boys as well as girls. They don't exist to provide highly paid jobs for education. Gender is a valid qualification for a teaching job, just the same now as it was in the 80s and 90s, when I was hiring women teachers because we didn't have enough role models. If I were hiring now, I'd be saying, boy, we need to be hiring some men teachers. See, we need, we may need some initiatives. School boards have got to hire teachers best suited to meet the needs of students. And quoting my friend Dave again, not just the ones who have low seniority. Different kinds of knowledge, different styles of learning, different methods of demonstrating that are equally valuable. Okay, parents. Are your sons garbage? What you thinking about it? Are your sons garbage? Oh no. 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 Okay. Are you going to have them grow up to be obsolete? No. 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 So the message for all of us. You want this to continue? Do nothing. Just do nothing. It will continue. So go out there and do something about it. Final note. There's something to be learned from the gay pride parade. I was talking to some gay friends in, in the UK just last month. And they were talking about the fact that in the early days, being involved in this took a lot of courage because there was so much opposition to it. For example, most politicians, I don't say all of them, but most politicians wouldn't dare to be seen as supporting it. Well, after years of persistence, not giving up, the gay pride parade is now a commonplace event. And most politicians wouldn't dare not to be seen as not supporting it. So guess what? It's time for some male pride initiatives. Male pride for him? How about a Canadian center for men and families? How about that?
because you know equality means equality for everybody. So this is based on my book, and, and here's one of my here's one of my uh, favorite parts right here. We all know what little girls who made them. They're in spice and everything nice. Well, you know what boys who made them? Stars and moonbeams and boundless dreams. That's what little boys are. That's what your sons are. That's supposed to be me with my cat. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>